Amen. Amen. Um, why don't we stand? We'll start with the words. And um, we're going to read the prayer. That's in Ephesians 1, starting in verse 17. Lord, we thank you that you, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, gives to us, has given to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, that our eyes are of understanding are enlightened and that we know what is the hope of your calling, what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance and the saints. And Lord, thank you, we're the saints. And what is your exceeding greatness of your power toward us who believe, according to the working of your mighty power, which you worked in Christ, when you raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly faith places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also that is which to come. Thank you, Lord. That's the good news that um, you've given us, not only for us, but to share and to preach and to change the world, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that um, we're here today to, to study and, and um, to, that uh, you're the, the one that, through the Holy Spirit, opens our eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise amen. God. You please be seated. Well, this morning as um, I was getting ready, you know, I get up and I check the weather. And the weather, that was good news today because uh, when I checked the wind chill, the wind chill was supposed to be about 35 degrees today and last a few days ago, it was 50 below, so it's about an 85-degree swing. So I said, that's really good news. So there's the good news for Sunday. And then I continued to, you know, flip through the, the news and watch the news. And, um, you know, most of the news that you see on TV is not good news. You know, so, you know, it's really easy to, to uh, get uh, fixated on what you see. You know, whether you watch Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or whatever the news is, because there's a lot of bad news out there. And so I, I watched bad news after bad news after bad news, and I said, that's enough of that. Let me get back to the Bible, because Amen. this is the real good news, right? Um, so good news with the weather, bad news with all the things going on. But, you know, it's good that for, as we as Christians that we stay informed, because what's our mission on the earth? So the bad news serves a purpose. We can't dwell on it. But the reason that the bad news serves a purpose is we need to know what our ministry is. So, you know, when we do see those headlines, don't, don't be in fear. You know, don't get upset. Don't get fixated on the negative. But what, what we should be doing is saying, Lord, what should I be praying about? You know, what should I be doing? You know, I, I, I know I should be doing things like voting, but um, what are those other things that maybe I personally need to be involved in, in personal ministry to help um, in our country, in our, in our neighborhoods? Um, so that bad news serves a purpose, but if we spend too much time fixating on it, we forget about the good news, right? And what, what should our focus be? It should be on the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. So um, we're going to continue on the story of grace. And I had spent probably three weeks putting together all kinds of notes, and I was inspired, and I had pictures. And um, yesterday, um, everything changed. So, you know, <laughs> praise God. But, um, but we're going to continue down the message of grace, and today we're going to talk about grace consciousness. Grace consciousness. So last time that um, I, I talked, when I talked about the, the God's ecosystem of grace, how God's God's basically, his system is based on grace, and grace is that love of God, that the free spirit, the free giving of God, all the free gifts, the things that we just prayed for and believed for and received here this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 So, so praise God. God loves us. And we're going to talk about God's love. Is, you know, when did that love start, and how does that love work? And you know, So what is that grace? Um, so God loved us. From the beginning of time. So God loved us back before we were around, back when we were sinners, before we believed, before we even knew about him. God loves each and every one of us. So the, 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 the real good news is God loved us so much that he loved us with all of his, all of his being, which is hard for us to fathom from our earthly um, position, right? We're our perspective. But before we ever knew about him or accepted him, God loved us. God loved you. Amen. So if in Romans 5.8... If you want to take some notes or flip over there, um, Romans 5, 8. Well, let's go there um, because and you, you can put a, a bookmark or if you've got one of these little cords in your Bible because we're going to come back to Romans quite often today. Uh, Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were still sinners, before we knew anything about the love of God, before we were accepted Jesus, before we, we knew anything about Christ, God loved us, and he sent his son, Jesus, to die as a sacrifice for us. That's how much he loves us. And so in, in Ephesians um, 2, 4 and 5, it's, it, there's a scripture that says basically the same thing. It says, even when we were dead in trespasses, those trespasses are sins. That's being far from God. 
right? We're in sin, we're, we're far from God, we're in our sin nature, and he made us alive together with Christ. So that's how much God loved us. And, and that, that word trespass can be translated sins or deviation or lapse or error, mistake. Um, so when we were in that world of, away from God, that he still made us together. And let's flip over to 1 John 4.19. We'll look at a few scriptures here before we, we have some stories. It's always good to have some foundational scriptures. And you know, like I've said before, you don't ever want to pick one scripture and, and make, a, make a, um, a doctrine out of that. You want to search through the Bible, um, through the Old Testament, through the New Testament. You want to look for those threads or themes so you can truly understand the nature of God and God's intent. First, First John 4.19 says... We love him. Who's him? It's capital H. So we love him. We love God. Yeah. Right? Because he first loved us. So he loved us first. So, you know, the founding of the world, God's love was. So he loved us. And everyone knows John 3.16, and I know we're, we're going back and reviewing quite a bit here. Um, but I think it's important for us to understand the grace of God. Um, John 3.16, if you watch football games, it hangs up on the side of the stadium, right? And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God loves us so much that he gave his Son so that we can be joined together with him forever. And not just in the future, but starting now. Starting from that point that you accept Jesus. So these are all New Testament scriptures. We talk about the New Testament and the Old Testament. And the Old Testament has... Um, a couple different sections that we're going to talk about today, but the New Testament is the story of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's the good news, right? So when, when we start the New Testament, we're still in the Old Covenant because Jesus was alive on the earth in the Old Covenant right up till the New Covenant started and when Jesus was sacrificed for us at the end of the Gospels, right? So if God loved us so much from the beginning of time that we just read in the New Testament, does God ever change? No. Does, does God ever change? So if God loves us now and he loved us from the beginning of time, does he always love us? Will he always love us? Um, right? It's easy to say that, to, uh, but a lot of times our, our uh, theology or our doctrine, because we don't necessarily feel loved, um, we get the feeling that God's changed somehow. And so I want to tell some stories about, um, you know, it goes tying back to the, the Old Testament, um, the whole, some of the Old Testament stories connected to our New Testament. So God doesn't change. In Hebrews 13.8, the Bible says, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same. He doesn't ever change. And in Acts 10, 34, it says God shows no partiality. So the other thing is not only does he not change, but he's the same for everybody. So he's not going to treat Dee, Dee any different than Tom. His love is the same. And sometimes we don't feel that way, right? Well, Lori's always blessed. So Lori gets always blessed. She's always blessed. You know, she is so blessed. She is so blessed. You know what? And I'm not that blessed. So God must love her much more than he loves me, right? Because she is so blessed. Well, it must be, because that's the way I feel, right? I feel that way because she, she, she gets everything she wants. Everything she prays for happens, right? But you know what? I, that, I don't see that happening in my life, but so God must love her more than... So that, but that's the way we get off track, right? Because our, our feelings or our observations are the things we don't really understand what's happening. And so we get the feeling that somehow God's changed or somehow God's different or somehow God's showing favoritism to Lori and not me. So here's some, here's some evidence, some proof. So if you want to flip back in your Bible to the book of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah, not a book we go to very often, right? But, you know, this, all, everything in the Old Testament it was doing nothing more than leading up to the New Testament. Amen? So it's not like there's two different, two different Bibles here. Everything in the Old Testament. Nehemiah 9.17. Nehemiah 9.17 says, You are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. And who was he talking about? Our disobedient, disobedient and rebellious ancestors. Right? If you read the story before that, it talks about disobedience and rebellion. And then here in Nehemiah 9.17, it says, You are God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. So even though they were, they were um, rebellious and they were disobedient, God still loved them and wanted to take care of them. He had his, their best interest at heart. So was God full of love in the Old Testament? 
you know, a lot of times we think of the Old Testament as being the fire and brimstone, people burning up and floods and all these terrible things that were happening. So God must not have loved his people for a period of time. But there it says God loved them. So we go to Isaiah 43, starting in verse 1. And that's a good one to go look at. No, Isaiah's way back here. Isaiah 43.1. Everybody there? All yeah, right. It says, but now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for an ransom, Ethiopia and Serbia in your place. And it goes on and on. Does that sound like God want, loves the people in the book of Isaiah? And that he has their best interest in his heart and he wants to bless them with an abundance in all things? Amen. Amen. So God loved the people in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah 54.10 it says, My steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, say the Lord, say the Lord who has compassion on you. So is God in Isaiah 54.10 a God of love? Amen, he is. So God's love is a theme from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. So there, you know, the idea that we serve an angry God who's just waiting in heaven to throw down a lightning bolt the first time we mess up is completely incorrect because we serve a God of love. And that, another way to look at that, to say that love would be we serve a God of grace. So when we talk about grace consciousness, it's being conscious to that overwhelming love of God that he pours out even to those that don't necessarily deserve it by our standards. Amen? But by, we, by his standards, we do because we're his creation. And, and now, that uh, word love that's used often in the New Testament, the Greek word, it's agape. And you've probably heard about agape love. There's different types of God, love in the Bible. There's phileo love. That's the brotherly love. Um, but agape love is that unconditional love. So it doesn't matter what we do. Unconditional means there are no conditions. So it doesn't matter what we do, that God loves us regardless. So it's not based on our performance. That's grace. That agape love displayed is grace. So that's, that's where that favor, that love, the, the healing power, the things that we saw happen here this morning are an outflowing, outpouring of God's grace in our lives. And that grace comes into our lives where we can really truly see it manifest, and that's explained in Ephesians 2.8. Ephesians 2 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. And then it continues to say, um, Not by works, lest any man should boast. So if it were something that we could do, Lori could say, Yes, Mark, I am blessed. And it's because I do this, and I do that, and I do the other thing, and I do. So she could boast in the things that happen in her, in her life. She doesn't do that, because she gives the glory to God. So I'm not saying you do that. So you're sitting in the front row, so I can. Use you an example. So, um, so she can't boast. She can't say I'm saved because I'm good. A lot of people think that God will save them because of their goodness. How many times have you had a conversation with someone where you say, have you ever accepted the Lord? And they say, well, I don't know if I'm good enough. You know, I mess up. You know, I've got this problem, whatever the problem is. You know, so I don't think the Lord can love me. God doesn't care about any of that because it's not about what you do. It's not about what I do. It's not about what we do, but it's about what God can do. So Lord can't boast about herself. She can boast on God, right? But she can't boast on herself. I can't boast on, on, on myself to say, look how good I am. Look how good I am. Because you know what? God doesn't look at that. God doesn't look at that. He looks at Jesus and he sees us. Or he sees Jesus when he looks at us. So by grace we have been saved through faith, not by any man. It's a gift from God. So God's good all the time. All the time. God's never not good. He has only good in mind for you. So in the last time we, that um, I was able to teach and we talked about the grace, the ecosystem of God, um, we talked about people that like to go back to the law because some, as people, we like to have that checklist of here are the 10 things I need to do, you know, the 10 things to lose weight, the 10 things to better finances, the 10 things to whatever it is. We like to buy the self-help book that gives us the checklist. If I do these 10 things, I'm going to be successful. And we've been conditioned to do that, and it, makes our, it puts our, our world in a tidy little box. 
So we can say, here's the 10 things. So if I pray an hour a day and I give this much and you know, I, I, um, I serve the poor, I feed the hungry, check, 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 check. Okay, I'm good with God. Therefore, I, you know, I've already checked all my boxes, right? So we make this list. And then we do, we do have callings from God and we should fulfill our callings, but there's no checklist that is standard that we all get the checklist where we, you know, we, we have to check off our, our um, accomplishments in order to be in right standing with God. And somehow people like to go back into the world of the Old Testament and come up with the rules that they have to live by, and they put all this pressure on themselves, which is outside of the grace of God. That's exactly the opposite of what God wanted to do when Jesus came along in the New Testament, the, the New Covenant was started. So let's go to Romans 5.8. Again, so hopefully you kept your finger there. You put your bookmark in uh, that part of the Bible. We're going to come back here a couple times today. So we talked about 5.8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. How does he demonstrate his love toward us? In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were still sinners. So how many of you were alive back then? I, I wasn't. Um, so if we weren't alive back then, then how were we sinners at Christ? died for us. How could we have been sinners 2,000 years ago? If our sin, if our, if our salvation is based on our own works. Well, we'll get there. So let's look at verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So we'll be saved from wrath. So justified means being made just as if you had never sinned, right? Justified, you've, you've been made right with God. It's, things are okay. So in verse 9 it says, We've been justified by his blood, by the blood of Jesus, and that we'll be saved from wrath through him. So all those evil things that could befall us, um, we don't have to be concerned about. Because Jesus took care of them all. So where does our wholeness come from? Jesus. Jesus. So where does our peace come from? Jesus. Jesus. Where does our healing come from? Jesus. Jesus. Where does our future come from? Jesus. Where does our love come from? Jesus. And Jesus is the one that provides all of those things for us. He already took care of it. And so we tend to want to strive to you know, make those things happen instead of accepting what Jesus has already taken care of. He's already given us all things in the book of Ephesians, right? In heavenly places. He's already provided for all those things. Um, because sometimes we don't feel loved because we feel pressured to perform. You know, the, you read a book and, you know, the books are good, but, you know, a lot of times we, we, in the corporate world we, we, we laugh and joke. We can always tell when the boss went to a new seminar or read a new book. Because all of a sudden, pressure's on to do something different. Okay, now we're going to do this today. You know, we're, I went to the seminar, I had this great idea, so, you know, we're going to make all these changes to our management system. And so we're going to stop doing this, and we're going to start doing that. And then six months later, the boss goes, not where I work. But not where I work. Um, so other places do this. And, it's, and the six months later, the boss goes to a seminar, reads a book, and they go, okay, now here's all the stuff we should, we should that was, wasn't quite right, so we're going to change everything again. We're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do the other thing. Right? And that's kind of our earthly way of always trying to find a way to perform using the, the checklist of that self-help. And so we do the same thing in the Christian world. We might read a book or get a message, and, um, and it might be a good thing. But um, now we take that to say, okay, I, everything I was doing before, I need to throw that out. And I need to start doing all this instead. And I need to pray more. You know, I need, to, I need to say this or not say that. I need to, you know, give more. I need to give less. I need to be involved in this ministry or that ministry or no ministries or all the ministries. And, you know, and sometimes we can, we can um, lose sight of the good news of the Jesus Christ because we're focused on our works and what we do and not the grace of God. So Colossians 2.6 says, the cure for that, in Colossians 2.6, the cure for that, it says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we accept Jesus. He accepts us, right? We're one and the same. He's our brother. We're joint heirs with Christ. We're kings and priests forever. So as that happens, we've, we receive Jesus Christ our Lord. It says, so walk in him. And what does it mean to walk in Jesus? Does that mean to read the self-help books and come up with the ten things you need to change? To do differently, it's always good to be looking inside and saying, "What do I need to do differently?" But you know, we don't get the checklist and say, "Here's," it, it, it's not a cookie cutter solution. Um, so we don't, we're not, it's not focused on what we do. Um, it's where focus is on our Savior. 
So when we strive to get healed, when we strive to get blessed, when we strive to get our prayers answered, where's our faith? It's on ourselves, right? So when we do that, we're saying, Jesus, what you did for us is not enough. Because now I need to put all that pressure on myself to do all those works to get what I need from God. And that's not what God intends at all, because he's a God of grace. He's a God of love. Um, so just, here's, a, here's an example. I heard um, Andrew Womack give this example. He said, so if we ran into somebody who was a habitual drunk, they're always drunk, they're the town drunk. When my parents lived up in the UP, there was a gentleman that who would always hang out downtown. Well, not much downtown. There may be three buildings downtown, but um, the downtown, and, and he was a town drunk, right? And he was always under the influence of alcohol. I always felt really sorry for him, but... You know, he was, a, he was a happy drunk. He was a nice guy, but he was always inebriated. And so as Christians, what we would probably do is reach out to him, and we'd love on him, right? And we'd tell him, Jesus loves you. You don't need to live like this. You know, there's better things. You know, and we'd really, you know, we'd really love on him and, and, and bring him into the, the, the body of Christ. Now, what if he were a, a born-again Christian? What if he were a Christian? Would we still have the same reaction to him? of saying, oh, Jesus loves you, God loves you, you know, we love you, um, and let us help you, do you need you know, warm clothes, do you need food, will we reach out to him, or would we now say, hey, you're a Christian, what do you think you're doing? You can't do this anymore, right? And now, why would our attitude be different if someone's not a Christian and we're trying to minister to them and they become a Christian? Because now what happens is we become that, um, that, uh, the, the, the believers that now are focused on that list of rules, in that body of works, right? So now we tend to become harsh and critical and say, now that you're a Christian, so shouldn't it be the other way around? You know, it almost seems like it should be the other way around if, if it's going to be different um, because, you know, we, if you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament was the, the, um, the, the lessons that people needed to learn to show that they needed a Savior. So because of the law, people could say they needed a Savior so that they could walk in the love of God. So it, somehow in Christianity, we get it backwards now where we're, we're loving to the sinners and we're, we're hard on the believers. We're, we're, we're easy on the sinners, those people that don't know Jesus yet. But when somebody becomes a believer, we all of a sudden become hard and we give them a list of the do's and don'ts and the rules. And so in Galatians 4.9, is kind of where we ended up the last time I was teaching. It, it says, but now after you have known God, or rather that you turn to the weak and blessed beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage. So Paul's telling the Galatians, you know, now you've known God. So this isn't a new problem. Now you know God, and you know the love of God, you know the grace of God, but yet you still want to go back to those things that were before you knew God. You're making it hard on yourselves, and you're taking yourself away, and you're being distracted from the things that God truly has for you. And so Paul says, so, so, um, but now you have known God, so now they're believers, or rather that you turn to the weak and beggarly elements, to those things that came were before, to which you desire again to be in bondage, which takes them back away from the love of God, but back to bondage. So, so here's a key point in all of this. Uh, most people think it's that it was their sin or is their sin that makes them a sinner. Let me say that again. So most people think it's their sin or their works, their negative works, that make them a sinner. And that's what you needed to be saved from. But remember, Jesus died 2,000 years ago to save you from your sin. You didn't do anything yet, right? So what was Jesus really saving you from? So let's go to Romans 5.12. We're still in the same area where your bookmark is. So Romans 5.12 explains this. Therefore, just as one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Let me read that again. Therefore, just as through one man, so who's the one man? Adam. Adam. So because of Adam, sin entered the world, and with sin came death, Right? So sin came death, and the death spread to all men because all sinned. So because of Adam's original sin, and we're going to go back and look at Genesis to understand that a little bit better, that's the sin nature that was imparted to mankind that we needed to be saved from. It's not, our, it's not because we did something wrong somehow 2,000 years ago when you know, nobody even knew we were going to be around other than God. 
but um, you know nobody even had any you know uh, idea that Mark was going to be born. Uh, I'm not going to give you the year when I give, when Mark was going to be born when I was born. Um, you know, as, as a person, right? So nobody had any idea. My parents didn't even know that I was going to be me, right? They knew that the baby was coming about nine months in advance. But 2,000 years ago, there was no idea about Mark, right? So that original sin nature came upon mankind because of what Adam did in the garden. Um, and so that sin nature was what had to be dealt with, not our misbehaviors or our misdeeds. So you can blame Adam, Okay, so we'll just blame Adam whenever, you know, we think about those things that maybe we were missing out on or, you know, in our early lives and, you know, before we came to know Jesus and we started to see our lives turn around back in those days. I mean, I lived those days where, you know, I, you know they're just things I'd just rather forget in my, my before Christ days. Um, but those aren't the things that made us sinners. What made us a sinner was the fact that Adam sinned. And so because Adam sinned, the sin nature came on mankind. Because the sin man nature was on mankind, therefore we sinned. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So Adam sinned, right? And we'll look at the book of Genesis in chapter 3 here in a second. And so because the sin nature came on mankind, so that sin nature, therefore we sinned. It's not the other way around. It's not because of our misbehavior, our sin, that we became sinners or not right as, to God's original intent. So let's look at Romans 5.20. So we're still in Romans. It says, More, Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So let's focus on that first part. More, moreover the law. So we talked about the law. So Moses went up on the mountaintop. He came down with the laws and all the rules. There are all those rules in the Old Testament, in the latter part of the Old Testament. So there are all those rules, and why do those rules exist? The, that was the law. It entered that offense might abound. Because well, how do you, when you have offense or you have sin, you have to have something to measure against, right? So how do you know you're doing something wrong if you don't know the dividing line between right and wrong? And that's what the law does to us. And um, just, Here's an example. So my first, uh, my first uh, four years of college... I had a backup plan because I was going to go in the Marine Corps, but I thought if that doesn't work out because the failure rate was really high, maybe I want to go to law school. So I studied law for four years. So I studied law for four years, and I went and flew jets, which has absolutely nothing to do with each other. But sometimes the law you know, experience has some you know, practical application like today. So let me talk to you about a, a current law, not a biblical law, but a current law. I looked at this up. Um, burglary in Wisconsin. Okay? Burglary is a crime. So it's an offense. So... You know, in the Bible, thou shalt not kill was a law. So if you killed that, you, you know, committed that offense. Well, let's talk about burglary. So in the law, um, there's some, out, some things that have to be in the law. The, the first one is it has to have a title or a, uh, an intent or a concept. So the, this one is just burglary. It's called ordinary burglary. There's actually different levels of burglary. We'll just talk about one. Ordinary burglary is the title of the law. And now, for every law, there has to be an a list of elements. And the elements of the law are the things that have to be proven in court to show that you violated the law. So here are the elements to the burglary in the state of Wisconsin. Element number one is intentional entering. So the prosecutor has to prove, if you're accused of burglary, that you intentionally entered a place. Then it says a, f a following places, and there's a big list, like a building or dwelling, an enclosed railroad car, ship or vessel, enclosed truck or trailer, motor home or trailer home, a room and the above. So that's the list. So you have to intentionally enter one of those places. And then element three is without permission or consent. So have to, they have to prove that there was no permission or consent. And then element four is with intent to steal or commit a felony. So those are the four basic elements of burglary in the state of Wisconsin. So if to be able, so that now you have a, so if you're doing something, you want to think, hey, am I committing burglary? You have a list you can check against, right? Okay, so I'm, I'm sure nobody in this room has to think about this. Um, but but a, and then the other part of the law, there has to be a punishment, because what if they said, okay, here's what burglary is, but there are no consequences. It's not really much of a law, is it? And every once in a while you'll see um, our government pass some kind of law and it doesn't have any kind of you know, punishment or consequence to it. And you wonder, you know, what, what good is that? It's just more informational. It doesn't really do anything. Um, so the punishment for committing that, so if a, a person were to 
um, be found guilty because they could prove all four of those elements. The punishment is 12 years, six months in prison, or a fine up to $25,000. So there's a punishment. So in, in, um, in the Old Testament, in the law, there was law, and there were punishments, right? But there was a time before the law, right? Was, did the law exist at the beginning? Did Adam and Eve live under the law? No, there, there, there was no law, but did God have an idea of right and wrong back at the beginning of time? Yeah, because God never changes. So it's not like, you know, when the people started misbehaving, he decided all of a sudden, I need to come up with some rules. Well, no, he already had an idea of what was good for people and not good for people, right? You know, he are, that was already in existence from the beginning of time because God never changes. Um, but before the law, um, looking at Romans 4, I'll show you where this is in Scripture so you don't think I'm just making it up. 4.14, Romans 4.14. And we're going to read through 15. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is made of no effect. So we'll stop there. So if the people back in the Old Testament, if the people that were under the law, that were violating the law, because nobody could withhold all of the law, if they were heirs, if they could become saved, then that there's no need for faith, right? I can follow the law and I can, I can make it, right? I can make it. So I could be good enough if I can follow the law and I can make it. So then faith would have, no, have made void and the promise is no effect. So that means, you know, what we know as coming to Jesus through faith would be non-existent because I could have a choice then. I could either accept Jesus or I could fulfill all the law and I end up in the same place. Right, so that's what this says: is that you know, if the law, if the law would work and we can get you to that same place, and then faith is no effect. We'll just do that instead. Um, and then, so we'll look at um, verse 15 now. I lost my place, and it says, "Because the law brings about wrath." There's that punishment, right? That we consequence that we just talked about. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. So, if that burglary law doesn't exist, can you be punished for burglary? No, so where there's no law, there is no transgression. You can't break a law that doesn't exist. Um, and I think I, in Romans 5.13 then, I got out of order here. So Romans 5.13 says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but the sin is not imputed when there is no law. So that, that word imputed, anybody use that word imputed very often in their day-to-day -day language? That's one of those words that doesn't get used a lot. So what that word imputed means is charged to, put to your account. So if you wanted to think of this as a, um, a, a financial term, well, I like those old shows, you know, the old black and white TV shows, um, you know, uh, Petticoat Junction, I think I just watched some of on the streaming video, right? And they're black and white, and they would go to the store and in the store, they would say, you know, I think it was Sam Drucker. Was that the storekeeper's name? Did I get that right? So Sam Drucker, young people are going, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. But so, do you? All right. Um, so it makes me feel a whole lot better. Um, so Sam Drucker, so what would they do? You never saw them exchange money. It would be, Sam, just put that in my account. Right? Put it on my account. So it would be, you know, he'd get his book out and he'd write in his book. You know, I, I imagine. I, I don't think they ever showed that, but. So Sam would put it on their account. So that's what imputed means, put it on that account. So it's now on your record, it's charged to you. So, so that word imputed means charged to you or put on your account. So it says here, so for until the law, sin was in the world. Okay, so before the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed. It's not charged to you because there is no law. There's nothing to measure against to tell you that you broke the law. So that's God's original intent. So this all started before the law. So we don't really understand how God loves us so much. We need to look back at his original intent for we as people because he started with that grace because he's never changed. So where there's no law, there's no sin, there's no transgression, there's no punishment. It's not imputed to you. So before, before the law, people were sinning, but God wasn't holding that sin against them. So they were doing things. Were they, doing, were they perfect? Were people perfect? Do you think Adam and Eve were perfect? No, I, I don't think, it doesn't say this, but I can't picture, you know, because remember God walked and talked with them in the garden, and I imagine him teaching and coaching and showing them what to do and what not to do, and he told Adam, here's your job, I'd like you to do this, and so, you know, they're, they're, they're working together. Um, but God loved them so much, you know, even though that they weren't 
perfect. Their works weren't perfect, right? They're, they're, they weren't a perfect work. Um, God never held any of that against them. So Adam and Eve, they misbehaved, though. Everybody remembers that story? You know, in the storybooks, it's always an apple, right? You know, they took the apple off the tree, and, and you know, why was that now a problem? Because did God tell them not to do that? God told them, and did he tell them that, you know, those bad things would happen if you took the fruit? Yep. So a lot of times we think, well, God suddenly got angry, and he said, I just don't want to have anything to do with those people anymore, so I'm going to cast them out. Right? Because, you know, our earthly feelings or emotions or maybe our model of what parents are like. Go to your room. Right? And you get, you get uh, banished. And, you know, maybe for a long period of time. No supper for you. And, you know, that's what we picture. But um, God never really left Adam and Eve. And we talked about this on Wednesday a little bit. So there's some explanation. Let's go to Genesis 3. This is the story of Adam and Eve. So, do you think God wants us to live just like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden? Yes. Yeah, that was God's original. Why did he make it that way if that wasn't his original intent? So, Genesis 3, 23, say amen when you're there. Amen, amen. amen. More amens? Amen. amen, okay, I think everybody's there. So, Genesis 3, 23. 2 and 23, and it says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil, and now, lest he put out of his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Okay, let's stop there. So what did, what did Adam and Eve do? They took the fruit from the tree of good and evil, and now what happened to them? What happened to them? It was the tree of good and evil. They ate the fruit. Their eyes were open to see good and evil. What did they see before they ate the fruit? Was there evil? No. So they, they chose to see evil, right? They chose to bring evil into their existence, right? God said now they can see good and evil. Now they have both good and evil. They're no longer walking in that perfect wholeness with, uh, with God in the garden because they chose to, to, um, to bring that, the knowledge of good and evil into their lives. And then the, the chapter 23 says, therefore... The Lord God sent them out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken. So what happened in 23? God sent them out of the garden. And to understand why, let's back up. So, you know, that therefore, that's a conjunction, right, Matthew? It is a conjunction. Matthew has a song. No, we won't make him sing the conjunction song. But, but when, you, when you see a conjunction, sorry, Matthew. That, that, that thought just, it just went through my, went through my head, so... Um, but the, the word therefore is a conjunction. So when we see that, you know, God, in 20, verse 23, sent Adam and Eve out of the garden, then we follow that therefore backwards to find out what was the real reason. It wasn't because he was sending them to time out, no. right? Because he was angry. I don't want to be with you anymore. I'm, I'm punishing you. It says he, therefore, he put them out because now they know good and evil. And then, and then it says, and he doesn't want them to take the tree of life and eat and live forever, right? right. So he's separating them from the tree of life. And why did he do that? Why did he do that? Why wouldn't he want them to take from the fruit of the tree of life and live forever? Yeah, yeah, Judy's got it. All right, Judy, high five. I thought. So what Judy said was then, they're, now they're in a fallen state. They're not in that state that God wanted them to be. And God's intent was to live with his creation forever. So now they'd be on the earth. They can see good and evil. So now they have, they're, they're in an evil fallen state. So now they have, there's going to be things like you know, sickness and disease and pain, um, and things that God never intended for his people. And if they ate from the tree of life and they could live forever, they would live in that fallen state forever on the earth. And that was not God's original intent. So it's not because God was angry and God wanted to be separated, but it was because God was protecting them from going someplace that he knew was going to be bad for them. And, you know, God does that to us today, right? So God doesn't, God doesn't you know, cause things to happen that are bad. He's not standing by with a lightning bolt waiting to judge us. So, oh, I can't believe they thought that. I can't believe they did that. And they got them for that one. 
because God's a God of love. So sometimes things don't work out the way we think they should, but God's heart is always in our best interest. Amen? Just like our God. So the, the, his motivation was a motivation of love. God's motivation is always a motivation of love. It's never anything else. So you just helped me get through two pages of notes there. Thanks, Judy. So, so God loves us too much to allow us to live with evil, pain, physical imperfections, problems, hatred, strife, all those things that come with being in a sinful nature. Without having a hope to someday to leave all that temporary, temporary physical body, leave our temporary physical bodies and be in his presence as a new creation, right? Because we're going to have new bodies in heaven with, in, in, and we're going to be forever with him. So the, the, the moral of the story, I think, here is that God doesn't hate us and he doesn't, he's not waiting to punish us, but there are earthly consequences to our actions. There are earthly consequences to our actions, but God's response to us is always one of love, not a punishment. So God always has something better for us. So in Genesis chapter 4, you can flip over there if you want to look through that. Genesis chapter 4. I'll tell you where it is so you can look at it while I'm talking. I'm going to just tell you a story. Um, chapter 4, verse 1, and through, through 9, 1 through 9. So this is a story of, um, of, of Cain and Abel. Everybody remembers the story of Cain and Abel from uh, Bible school days, but I'll give you the, give you the Cliff's Note version of it. Um, so Adam and Eve had two sons. They had Cain and Abel. So Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. So Abel was a shepherd, and Cain was a farmer. So in the process of time, it came that they brought an offering of fruit, because of the, right? So they, they were giving offerings to the Lord, and they were giving offerings because of the law said they had to, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there was no law. That was a trick question. So, so why were they giving offerings? Why, why were they giving offerings? Because they... They were giving things, but why did the, how did they know they were supposed to give offerings? God told them? That would be assumption. Yeah, so God told them? Adam and Eve told them, right? It was part of their relationship with God, and what was, do you think their motivation was? Because are, is there any law here? Remember, where there is no law, there is no transgression, and when there's no transgression, there's no consequences, right? There's no punishment. So there, there wasn't anything that God said here in the, this early part of the Bible that shows us his original intent, that showed Cain and Abel that you must bring your tithes and offerings to me or else you'll get this or you won't get that, right? So they were bringing it as an act of love. And because they walked and talked with God. So, you know, God's there still continuing to teach them. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit further here how, you know, God's still in the picture. So even though Cain and Abel are outside the Garden of Eden, God's still in the picture. And um, you gotta, you got to you know, look at the end of the story and you can piece together the middle. Um, so they brought their offering. And he corrected Cain, right? Because, you know, it says here in verse six, in 4, the Lord respected Abel and his offering. So he said, Abel, good job. High five. You did good. And he told Cain, hey, Cain, it's not quite right. Okay? It doesn't say doesn't say he punished him. He just, he corrected him, right? So he said, Cain, you know, next time, you know, here's what I'm looking for. Here's how this works. And um, so what happened to Cain? Cain got very angry. And so now here's the Lord talking to Cain. So this is just proof right here that God was still interacting with um, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, even after they're outside of the Garden of Eden. So he wasn't far away. He's still there. So God said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your countenance fallen? So he's still talking to Cain. And so then Cain went and talked to Abel. And then Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. So back then, did they know what murder was? Did the law exist that said, thou shalt not kill? No. In a stone tablet? There was no law yet. So, so at this point, the first murder just happened. So Cain just killed Abel. So then the Lord came to Cain and said, Hey, Cain, where's Abel? And the Cain, just to show how familiar that, uh, that Cain was talking to God. Imagine if you did something wrong, okay? 
Um, use your imagination. Think of something that you know you tend to struggle with, and you maybe you mess up on. You know, maybe you don't talk so nice all the time, or you get angry, or you know you drive too fast, or you know, I don't know what it is, but you do something wrong. And what if you're doing that thing that you you struggle with, and all of a sudden God out of the heavens said, "Hey," you, you'd probably drop dead of a heart attack, right? And God, oh, you know, it would be all over, or, or you know, because. But look at what Cain did. Cain very casually said when. Um, he said, God, God spoke to him and said, hey, where's Abel? And Cain, bloody hands, puts him behind his back. He said, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. You know, so that shows a lot of familiarity there with God, right? So, there, there, you know, there's, there's evidence here that God was still walking and talking and interacting with his creation, even outside of the Garden of Eden. And so now what happened to, um, to Cain, even after this? So... You know, if you look in the uh, in the in the Old Testament laws, there's all these things that you that w- the law says that if you do these, you will be put to death, right? So there's some rules here in Leviticus. It says, um, yeah, before we get to the the rules, so so there, you see, they're really familiar. So I got a, there's somebody I know very well, and um, the story about. Um, a Christian man, um, and uh, some struggles in the family, and his 17-year-old son one day just walked out of the house and was gone for a year. No communication, no contact. You know, so I know this father's, this father's heart ached, and he yearned to be back in touch with his son, not knowing what happened to him. And so if an earthly father has that kind of emotion or connection or desire to be connected with his children, how much more do you think God would have hurt if he would have cast out the people to be separated from them for an extended period of time, perhaps forever? So, you know, if you put things in that context, the idea that, that God would cast them out not to have anything to do with them um, goes completely against God's character. God's desire is to be close. God's desire to us is to be close. God's desire to us back before we even knew him was to be close. So, so to think that God was angry to cast people out um, it goes completely against God's character. So sometimes when we're feeling like God's far away, guess who moved? Well, we did. There's something going on with us and our understanding. God didn't go anywhere because God loves us that much. So in the book of Leviticus, um, so there's some other examples of the before the law. Um, it says that um, in Levit- Leviticus 18, we're not going to read that. You can look it up later. Um, but it says if uh, a man were to marry his half-sister, he would be put to death. So there's a law. The law says so if you marry your sister or your half-sister, you're gonna, you should be killed. But you know what? Abraham married his half-sister. Sarah was his half-sister. So did God kill Abraham? Well, that was before the law, right? Because where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, there is no punishment. You know, he had multiple wives, too. Now, God tells us in the New Testament that, you know, we should have one husband and one wife, not multiple spouses. So, you know, but he didn't, that didn't come into the New Testament where God explained that. But in the Old Testament, so do you think God decided in the New Testament he's going to make a new rule? You know, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, you know, there were Abraham, Jacob, Moses all had multiple wives. And Abraham, again, you know, lying um, is, is a sin, right, in, under the law? Well, he lied about his sister. He was concerned that, or his wife, he was concerned that, you know, he would be hurt because his wife, when she was in her 60s and her 90s, was so beautiful that people were going to steal her or, or, or kill him to get her. And so he lied. But he had an amazing faith. I mean, he was called the friend of God, right? So he was a man of faith. So before the law, before the law, God didn't take people's performance to determine their relationship with him. He did not look at their performance, so the, that law didn't exist. So it was, they all lived in God's grace. Now let's look what happened to Cain then back at the... So Cain, Cain was the first murderer. Let's go down to um, Genesis 4. Starting in 13, it says, Cain said to the Lord, so they're still chatting, My punishment's greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. 
I shall be a fugitive and vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. So he's concerned that, you know, now that he's uh, first murder, that something really terrible is going to happen to him. And then the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord said, A mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. So what did God do after all of this? He protected him. And why is that? Because God's motivation is love. That's God's grace in action. So but before the law, what happened is, why did the law even have to come into existence then? Because if you keep reading on, and we're not going to go into this, um, maybe we could, this will be a series sometime, but um, the people mistook God's mercy, God's grace, with approval. So you can see, if you read through the early part of the Old Testament, people's behavior got worse and worse and worse, because God, there was no punishment for transgression, so people said, well, if God's not punishing me, therefore it must be okay. So... If this much, how, how many have kids? And can picture this. Okay, I can do this much. I got away with that. Yeah, I got away with that. And before they know it, the behavior went from being marginally bad to being terrible, right? So, and that's what was happening in the early part of the Old Testament is people said, well, God has mercy, therefore I can, I can go a little bit further. And you look at Sodom and Gomorrah and the things that happened later on in the Bible, and you know you can read through that. I'm not going to go into all that, but you know people have gone far, far away from God's original intent um, back in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. So in uh, Genesis four, here's one example: Lamech. It's right here where we have our fingers. So Genesis four, verse twenty-three: Lamech said to his wives. Ada and Zilla, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me. So he killed somebody in self-defense. Lamech did. Even a young man for hurting me. And he says, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. So basically he said, if Cain got avenged, God's going to do the same even more for me. So now we went from the first murder to the second murder to on and on and on, worse and worse and worse. So, you know, this does sound familiar. People still justify it this way, right? You know, they justify their behavior this way. Well, Didi got away with it. So, Didi, Didi can do that. Well, I can do that too. Well, if Didi can do that, then I can do a little bit even more because it's okay, right? Because I have special favor, so I'm going to get away. And, so, and then Didi looks at Mark and says, well, Mark could get away with that. Well, I can go a little bit further. I can get away with even more. And we start justifying our behavior, not based on any kind of uh, standard, but we justify it against each other, and, and it becomes very relative. So we end up with this, this um, skewing of behaviors and skewing of values. You know, you, you look at things that um, you see and hear on TV, and you think about back when we were children and the things that were allowable and not allowable and how that's changed to now just about anything goes, right? So, you know, over time, because we have this relative standard, it's not really a standard if it's relative, but it's, it is a relative standard. We're, not, we're looking at something that's movable or changeable or an opinion to create a standard. We don't have God's standard in front of us. And um, so, you know, we see friends doing that. We see family members doing that. You know, celebrities are big influencers, right? In advertising, you know, they influence people's behavior, taking, you know, a little bit, something a little bit further, a little bit further, and a little bit further. And so, um, you know, so every time someone sins, when you misbehave, when we, we, when we slip up, um, we give the devil an opportunity to destroy our lives just a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. And after a while, you look back and go, how did I end up here? Right? God still loves you, but because of the choices that we made, you know, we end up in some place where we didn't want to go. And those are all consequences of our free will, because God gave us a free will, not God's will. God didn't do it to us. We did um, so the, the law came in uh, 1 Timothy 1, 5 through 11. It says the law is not made for a righteous person. So the law came so people could see that. The people that were way over here could see that, hey, I need to change something because I'm way off base now. I need to get back to God's original intent, and I need to start working my way back there. And then what was at the end? They could never really work their way all the way back, but they would get to the point where they were trying, and they would say, the only way I'm going to make it is with a Savior. Right? So the law was to bring people back and show them that they needed a Savior. And so it says in 1 Peter 2, verse 1, it says, through Jesus we have become righteous. Through Jesus truly makes us righteous, not our works. So we can try to use our works to become righteous, and then it would very quickly find out that it's physically impossible. We just can't do it, so we need a Savior. So the law is of no effect. 
the law is of no effect. It can only point us in the right direction. But the only thing that can help us is uh, the motivation of love through God's grace and God's love. And Jesus said in Matthew 22, he says, um, the disciples said, what, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love your Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So Jesus came to fulfill the law with the law of love, and that's a demonstration of God's grace. So we started out with God's grace in action, where there was no law, there was no transgression, there was no punishment. The law came, and the law said, you know what, you've you got to get back to, toward God, and here, I'm going to show to you, 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 know, you can't ever possibly fulfill the law. And then once Jesus came and we accept him, now we're back under that law of grace, where God loves us so much. And he tells us in the New Testament in Matthew 22, well, all we got to do is love. That's all we got to do. So if, if our, our desire matches God's desire, God loves us, and we love him, everything's going to work out. So, so here are some, uh, a couple last scriptures here. I think I still have about 20 pages of notes. Uh, but we'll save that for another time. Um, so Romans 5.13, we talked about Romans 5. So before the law, there was no punishment for sin. So that showed that our, we consciously knew we needed a Savior. And then 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 through 19 that's 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So God doesn't want to impute our trespasses to us. We impute our trespasses to us. We take those things. We, you know, and uh, you know, I, I, there there might be consequences to our action. For example, if you if you don't eat in a healthy manner, you could cause problems in your body, right? Um, if you smoke, God, there's no spiritual um, consequences of smoking, but smoking kills lungs. Lung cells, right? So if you choose to smoke, that's your choice. God gave us a free will. But there could be physical consequences. If you, if you drink um, large amounts of alcohol, that could have consequences on your liver. If you drive recklessly, you could have possible body, bodily harm to yourself or your family or other people. Those are all physical consequences to our actions. But God says we're free to do all those things. And he still loves us just the same. Um, Andrew Womack said this, and I like it, so I'm going to adopt it. It says, God even loves stupid. Mm -hmm. Praise God, God loves stupid. Because I look back at things that I did even before I was saved, and I did some stupid things. I did some things I'm not proud of, I just would not rather forget. And in the years past, I might think about those things and go, oh God, I really messed up back then 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever it was. I really messed up. But you know what? God doesn't care because I gave my heart to God. So it's me dwelling on that. God's forgiven and forgotten because when I accepted Jesus Christ, all that went under the blood of Jesus, and it was washed away. So... So maybe you've done some stupid things. Maybe you're still doing some stupid things. I know I do stupid things from now time to time, but God even loves stupid. Um, so look, he's using us in this congregation. He's using you and your individual ministry. He's using you and your family and your place of work. And, and God can work with you where you are, as long as your motivation and your desire is just to serve and love God just like he loves you. So Romans 8, 1 says, There's therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you feel condemned, it's not God condemning you. Because God loves you. If you're feeling condemned, that's Satan working in your mind, trying to take you far, far away from the grace of God. You're accepted through Jesus. God loves you. And so instead of being focused on those things that we did wrong, the stupid things that we've done in our lives, the stupid things that maybe we continue to do, we need to be focused on the grace of God who loves us no matter what. And that's why we need to be grace conscious, not law conscious, not condemnation conscious. Don't be so hard on yourself. God loves you. So when you mess up, what do you do? Do you kick yourself and do you fret and worry and get angry and beat your head against the wall? No. You go to God and say, God, thank you so much for your mercy that are new every day, every morning. They're new every morning to me. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. That I messed up. I'm going to try to do better. Right? I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to do my best. And uh, you move forward. We keep moving forward. So be grace conscious. So... Um, so let's get ready for our offering. So let's uh, we have some music and prepare your heart for giving today. Just like 
in the in before the law? What was the motivation in the in with um, the Adam and Eve and their family with Cain and Abel of their giving? They brought to God a gift because it was a gift of love. They were they were friends. They were they had a relationship, and this is that time where we honor God with the uh, with the first of our, our um, with our tithes and our offerings and our and our, and our giving. So you so, said. Remember God's grace. God loves you. And so you, you can't give too much. You can't give too little. Right? God doesn't look at your works here. So, so it's, this is between you and God. So let, we're, let's worship God and we'll, we'll worship God with our giving too. In Jesus' name. Amen. Of the wicked is laid up for the just. It gives God pleasure to see you prosperous. Blessed is the man who in that promise trusts. All the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. When you delight in the word of God and meditate in the truth, you're like a tree planted by the rivers bearing lots of fruit. You're blessed in the city and blessed in the field because you're diligent and God says, not as far as it's yours, promised land. All the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. It gives God pleasure to see you prosperous. Blessed is the man who in that promise trusts. All the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. It gives God pleasure to see you prosperous. Blessed is the man who in that promise trusts. All the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. All the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. Yes, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. That's us. Yeah, that's us. Praise God. We're the just. And you know, because we're the just, our sins are not imputed to us. Right? Amen. Because Adam sinned, sin came on the world, and we were born of the sin nature. And because of that sin nature, we sin. But because of what Jesus did, because his body was broken and his blood was shed, there's no more. That's, that sin is dealt with. Amen. That's the good news. That sin is dealt with. We can move forward, and we can walk in love and the grace of God. And so that's what we're doing when we take our communion. We're remembering that what Jesus did for us, that his body was broken so that we could be healed, that we could be made whole, and that he suffered so that we don't have to. So let's eat together as we remember. And then the, the juice reminds us of Jesus' blood that was shed. Is that final sin offering, right? In the Old Testament, because of the original sin, they had to give um, offerings often to cover the sin. But because Jesus' blood was the final offering sent from heaven, that that sin was dealt with once and for all. So the sin nature is gone. We might still mess up, but our, the sin nature is gone. There's, where there is no law, there is no transgression. Where there is no transgression, there is no punishment. Right? So that's under the law. So praise God that we're not under the law. We thank you, Lord, for the new covenant that we have in your blood in Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. So everybody get what they need this morning? Amen. You know, coming to church is better than going to the store. When you go to the store, you go to the store and you have a shopping list and you pick up a few things. When you come to church, you might come with some things in mind, but you always leave with more. You always leave with more. So anytime you can study the Word of God, so it's not just church, but anytime you can study the Word of God, there's all these treasures in here um, that we can mine. Um, if you read the Kenneth Copeland's um, devotional this morning, it goes right in line with what we just talked about. So praise God. If you haven't looked at that, look at that when you go home. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word, the mighty miracle working power of your word. As we study today and uh, our eyes being even opened more, that you made, you made all this available to us uh, so many years ago when your son Jesus sacrificed himself for us. And we thank you, Lord, for this body of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for this ministry. We thank you, Lord, for all these people. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll see you Monday, men, and Wednesday.